of following suit, will marijuana legalization come to the Northeast? Um, in November 2012, Colorado and Washington became the first states to tax and regulate marijuana on a statewide level. Today, we are seeing state lawmakers and drug policy reformers discussing similar initiatives in several key Northeast states. During this panel, we will hear from experts from at the national and state levels as they discuss what we can expect over the next election cycle and how we can get involved. Um, so if the panelists just want to introduce themselves and explain uh, their current role in mar marijuana policy reform. Uh, well, I'm really not involved in marijuana policy reform. <laughs> uh, my name is Peter Christ. I am one of the co-founders of LEAF Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And uh, though marijuana is obviously part of the problem and a, and a big part, and a lot of people are being harmed by it, and I'll certainly be the happiest camper in the world when they finally get it legalized and we stop wasting our time on this stupid stuff. But it really is a leap issue. The leap issue is prohibition, the policy of prohibition, and I will touch on that as we go through here and show you how it affects us. But that's me. Uh, I'm Evan Nissen. I'm the executive director of Normal New Jersey and the co-founder and director of New York Cannabis Alliance. Uh, so I focus mostly on New York and New Jersey legislation, uh, working with legislators there. Uh, recently, I took on another role of the director of the Northeast Cannabis uh, Division for Terratech Corporation, which is a publicly traded uh, company setting up greenhouses uh, across the country. Right now, growing herbs and leafy greens, eventually going to grow marijuana. So concentrating in New Jersey and New York, but starting uh, to, to get involved a little bit elsewhere in the Northeast. Uh, my name is Zach Hoover. I'm the Chief of Staff for State Senator Dalen Leach. Uh, Dalen represents the 17th District in the Pennsylvania State Senate. It's about a half hour away from here. Uh, we've written legislation to legalize uh, medical marijuana in Pennsylvania and another bill to have full legalization in Pennsylvania. I'm Morgan Fox, I'm the communications manager for the Marijuana Policy Project. I do mostly with uh, using the media to promote our policy goals, both in the Northeast right. and around the country. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you, anybody understands. Do you understand why I'm saying thank you? Uh, Leap happened because MPP threw money out on the table and started us. So anytime I meet anybody from MPP, I always want to say thank you. Well, you, know, you guys are kicking ass. <laughs> um, so I've got to introduce myself to um, Eric Casey, um, a current senior at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and speaking of Rhode Island, um, there's uh, many states that are in the running to be the first state um, in the Northeast to legalize. So I was wondering um, what the panelist's opinion about that uh, was and what the first state would be. Well, Rhode Island is actually one of our target states. Uh, we're pushing uh, legislation uh, championed by uh, uh, Angelo and several others. Uh, unfortunately, one of our uh, major champions was Gordon Fox, who for reasons unknown has been uh, kicked out of office. And uh, unfortunately, he was also in charge of the uh, Judiciary Committee. Uh, hopefully, that won't be a major problem because we have a lot of supporters uh, on that committee. So I think that we're going to be able to uh, continue moving forward with that legislation. Uh, there might be some you know, media snafus, but we're trying to distance ourselves from anything that's going on there. Uh, unfortunately, nobody knows what's going on with uh, Fox. So. It's <laughs> something we've been keeping an eye on as a chat. And I'd say Rhode Island as well. It's certainly not going to be Pennsylvania. <laughs> it is inevitable that it will happen in Pennsylvania, um, but it's certainly not going to be first. We say if something's a good idea, Pennsylvania will do it the week after Mississippi. <laughs> you know, when I, was up, when I, I love Buffalo. And we used to call it Pencil Tucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, Maine is actually another really big target. Uh, we've been doing a, uh, a program very similar to what we've been doing in Colorado where we're working on local initiatives uh, to uh, garner uh, lowest law enforcement uh, priority initiatives as well as legalization on a city level, which doesn't necessarily protect anybody from arrest, but they are important symbolic moves and uh, will really help uh, move that legislation along. And if it does not pass through uh, the legislature, uh, it will pass through the ballot initiative. I'd say New Jersey could be soon if Christie is forced to resign or gets arrested, hopefully. <laughs> we have a very supportive legislature. Uh, we recently introduced a bill earlier this week. 
Um, the Senate President already came out uh, saying that he's open to the idea, but the governor said he's going to veto it. So I think as soon as we get a new governor in office, uh, which is inevitable, hopefully sooner, um, we could have legalization in New Jersey. Um, so this is a similar question, but um, what, what kinds of reforms can we expect in the next few years in the North East? Are we going to see more decriminalization campaigns in states that don't already have them? Uh, in New Jersey, we're sort of skipping decrim now as a strategy. Um, we found that there's a lot of support for both decriminalization and legalization. Mm -hmm. uh, since we're sort of waiting for the governor before we make our next move, uh, we're just going to move legalization and, and try to skip decrim altogether. Almost every single state in the Northeast has decrim, uh, except for New Hampshire. And uh, the decrim bill there is actually moving quite well. Uh, it's, very, very strong. There's lots of legislative support uh, in both the House and Senate. Um, our uh, tax and regulate bill recently was uh, destroyed uh, by a, a terrible margin, uh, largely for political purposes, but also because the, uh, uh, I think it was the uh, Pediatric Association of New Hampshire was uh, handing out uh, papers with candies on them saying, you don't want kids to find marijuana in this, and to legislators. I mean, it, it's just a little fear mongering, and it unfortunately cost us 50 votes. I'll say that I think New York will probably legalize medical marijuana in the next couple of years. I think it'll probably be this year, but I thought that for the last two or three. <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure it'll happen. You know, it's funny when you mentioned decrim, I was up in Vermont last June doing some presentations, and when I would walk into the Rotary Club or whatever, I was going to be doing the presentation, they knew what I was going to be talking about. And they would say to me, hey, you know, uh, our governor just signed a bill to decrim marijuana here in uh, Vermont. And my answer was, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, we did that in New York State in 1975. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a call in 30 years and let me know how it's going. <laughs> I think Pennsylvania will legalize medical marijuana within the next few years. 86% um, <clears throat> of Pennsylvanians support it. People say, well, that's just crazy people from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, but statewide, 84% uh, of people 65 and older support it, um, which is a huge number. Um, we're right now in Pennsylvania, uh, we're, we're dealing with a huge campaign involving kids who have uh, that syndrome, it's a type of epilepsy, uh, where they can seize up 100 plus times a day. Um, it completely uh, uh, stunts their growth, uh, both mentally and Physically, of course, they're seizing so much, so, mm -hmm. so they have a lot of muscle redevelopment. Is that a word? That's not a word. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, because I, you guys have, may have heard of this strain that's come out of Colorado called Charlotte's Web, it's very, very high in CBDs, very low in THC, so it's the same effect essentially as uh, non alcoholic beer. I mean, you could get drunk if you drank enough non alcoholic beer, but you'd probably get too full of non alcoholic beer and not be able to take anymore before you felt the effect. Um, it's bringing a lot of people around. We've had a couple of hearings on it. Um, by our count in the state Senate, 34 of the 50 senators would vote for medical marijuana if it was brought to the floor. It's not going to be brought to the floor by the Republican majority because their governor, who's up for re-election this year, has said that he would veto it. They don't want to put him in a position where he actually has to veto something that 86% of the would support. So for the time being, I guess these kids just have to have their seizures. I'm really glad you brought that up, Zach, because uh, that is actually creating a really big problem with uh, passing medical marijuana laws around the country. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the the um, the visibility of these kids that are very much helped by this particular strain is causing lawmakers to uh, basically have cover so that they can try to introduce CBD-only bills that will help these kids, but leave 98% of other patients, uh, you know, hanging out to dry. And uh, they just are still able to look compassionate uh, when uh, they're in front of the TV cameras, but yet they're not really, uh, you know, burning any bridges with law enforcement. They're, uh, you know, it's, it's very safe for them. And we're starting to see this in Utah, in Georgia, in North Carolina, uh, you know, really around the country. Uh, the thing that I really worry about is that the, uh, the prominence of these cases that happen to only be helped by this one particular strain is uh, going to create a situation similar to Marinol, where uh, only a very small percentage of patients are actually helped by this, but it gives them political cover to say, yes, we're doing something about it. And uh, you know, uh, luckily, a lot of it, particularly in Minnesota, uh, where the governor met with a lot of the, uh, what we call the epilepsy mommies, uh, who are wonderful activists, uh, 
they've been, uh, you know, basically turning down every sort of deal that the governor has thrown them because it's not going to help other patients. Can I, can I, can I just footnote that real quick? Um, <clears throat> we were faced with doing exactly that sort of bill. There was just this high CBD bill. Uh, Dalen, who's one of the most progressive members of the entire Pennsylvania legislature, was approached by a guy named Mike Fulmer, conservative Christian Republican, probably one of the most conservative members of the Senate, who had uh, some families in his district with children who had Tourette's syndrome. They approached him, he talked to his pastor, searched with the Lord, prayed hard about it, and came to us and said, look, why don't we introduce together a bipartisan bill that would be CBD only? Dalen said, look, we want to get what we can, so let's move forward on this. Former staff started writing the bill, and as soon as word got out that he was writing this bill, well, all of a sudden some Afghan war veterans with PTSD went and talked to him and said, look, this isn't going to help me. And some uh, cancer patients came to him and said, look, this isn't going to help me. Uh, a lot of people with, with um, a lot of different medical conditions came to him and eventually they just kept sending us different versions of their bill that expanded it further and further with each one. But essentially what we have now, the, the only reason it's not a medical marijuana bill is they're more comfortable calling it a medical cannabis bill. Other than that, it's full medical marijuana, but we just have to say cannabis because the M word very, very scary to Republican primary voters. <laughs> there is something to be said for incrementalism, too. Uh, my concern is that uh, lawmakers will go that far and not go far. Uh, it, it, the incrementalist part of this is the whole, to me, from, from my perspective, is the whole marijuana issue. Uh, I have not, in 25 years of being involved in this movement, I have never made a prediction. Uh, last December, I took a shot at making a prediction. Now, you can all call me up at the end of the year and tell me I was wrong, okay? But my prediction is before the end of this year, the FDA will take marijuana off of Schedule 1 and move it to Schedule 2. That will be legalized across the country medical marijuana. It will now be legal. And what that will also mean is when I go to the next EPA conference, about half the people that were at the last one will not be there because marijuana will now be legal. And that means that the whole overall incrementalism, the whole overall movement is going to be set back for a few years until we start hearing this. Wait a minute, we legalized marijuana and you said that it would take care of the gangs and the violence, but we still got the gangs and the violence. And, we still, and then we're going to have to get back to the original discussion about prohibition. Just a comment on incrementalism, all right? Uh, Abraham Lincoln was not an incrementalist. Abraham Lincoln abolished slavery. Now he could have, he could have, he could have passed a law that says you can only beat your slaves between <coughs> two and four on Friday. Uh, you have to give your slaves three square meals a day. Uh, you have to give them a warm, dry place to sleep at night. Now that would have reduced the harm to the slaves, wouldn't it? But it would have left slavery intact. And that's the argument I have. I know incrementalism is there, it's always going to be there, no matter what kind of change you're making, there's always, but I always struggle against it because there's a root problem here, and the root problem is prohibition, and, and living in a country that thinks that they have a right to put morality police on the streets, enforcing one person's interpretation of morality on what drugs to use, and we have to get to that discussion, and as I have seen after 25 years in this movement, and being told all through the 90s not to even use the L word, okay, that that's going to take a long time within this movement to get people to understand that there's a fundamental problem here. When, when Martin Luther King came out against the Vietnam War in the mid-60s, there were people in the civil rights movement that said to him, that's not our issue. Why are you bringing that up? It's not our issue. And I love King's response, because his response was, if you don't understand that that's our issue, you have no understanding of what our issue is. And this issue is about freedom, and it's about liberty, and it's about people having the right to make choices in a free society. And that's what we have to get the argument about. And after speaking to thousands of Rotary Clubs throughout the last 25 years, if I go to a Rotary Club to convince them that they, had, that they should vote for medical marijuana, which in my opinion is the biggest no-brainer in this whole discussion, I don't even care if it works. I know that every drug study that's ever been done, 30% of the people that got the placebo thought it worked. 
So I don't care if you think marijuana works, and it doesn't work, but you think it does, and it makes you feel better, who am I to tell you you can't have it, right? <laughs> but if I, get the, if I want to get that Rotary to agree to support medical marijuana, i got to get them to change their mind about marijuana. On the other hand, I can go to that same Rotary Club and tell them why heroin, methamphetamine, marijuana, all these drugs should be legal. And in order to agree with our position, they don't have to change their mind about any of those drugs at all. In fact, the more dangerous they think those drugs are, the more reason why they have to be legal, regulated, and controlled. So, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that uh, you know we really do have to have a conversation about like the larger drug war. Uh, the problem is getting laws passed. Uh, and uh, that's why we have to do public education. And talking to people just on a day-to-day -day basis is so important. And talking to legislatures. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we really have to continue the conversation with, even when, when we're making legislative victories and when we're passing ballot initiatives, uh, so that we can continue thinking about this in terms of the larger prohibition issue. All right, I'm changing gears here. This is a topic that's very relevant to everybody in the room. What can college students do to help you statewide uh, initiatives? What are they do through the ballot or through the legislature? That's again involved in the political process. I mean, uh, when I ran the Ithaca College chapter, we got involved in the local mayor's race and we helped elect a 24-year-old. Um, I think in, in the states that I deal with, I think that the support is there for legalization. I'm actually surprised um, at how many caucuses, whole caucuses sort of have come over. Um, but there's not the will yet. So I think we need to, to sort of, as students, make sure that there's will, political will, and that the electeds know that they either need to support it to get elected, or if they don't, yeah, I guess they, they need to support it to get elected. I mean, what Zach said earlier, like, uh, the, uh, the support in public opinion for medical marijuana is through the roof. Uh, you'd have to be an idiot not to support it as a politician, but yet people are still afraid of touching the issue. They're still afraid of being labeled as soft on crime, and they are still dependent on support from law enforcement. Uh, who get a lot of money from them. I'm sure Peter can uh, attest to that. Uh, the biggest thing is talking to your lawmakers and making sure that they know that uh, they can not only approach this issue, but they can be leaders on it, and it will not hurt their uh, political careers, but actually help them. Uh, what kind of messaging and rhetoric should um, college students be using? I think a lot of college students have a fear that they speak out on this issue, they're going to be seen uh, by adults as you know, some young pocket who hasn't figure out what he did. Um, obviously, anybody who's ever testified in front of the legislature knows that that's not their reaction. They're very, very surprised and happy to see young people speaking about any issue. So um, what kind of rhetoric on campus and off campus should uh, call the students in the future? This is going to sound stupid, but don't call them when you're high. <laughs> we get a fair amount of calls from people who are just clearly just off their chair. Uh, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> um, you know, one of the ways that we've brought people, particularly um, people from the from the conservative side over, is there's, there's real budgetary issues here. I mean, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania just as Pennsylvania, if you just take Pennsylvania, we lock up a higher percentage of our people than almost anywhere else in the world, right? We've got about 60,000 people in our state prison system in Pennsylvania. Now, when I was born in 1980, uh, that was, uh, it, it was, it was, from 1940 to 1980, that was anywhere between four and 8,000 people, right? So, for 40 years, you have between four and 8,000 people in jail, the Pennsylvania state system at any one time. 1980, we started to get tough on drugs. We just say no, three strikes you're out, no tolerance. Uh, from 1980 to now, as I said, about 60,000 people. It's between 56 and 60,000 people in jail. A lot of those are nonviolent drug offenders. And then, and that's just the state system. Never mind the county prisons, where a lot of the people um, who are busted for you know um, higher amounts of marijuana, but otherwise nonviolent, you know, some of these people, they go to prison. It's their first criminal offense, and a county jail is where you learn to become a professional criminal. Um, so they come out more offenses. They get moved up into the state system. We're spending enormous amounts of money on this. And we've been able to bring over a lot of people on the conservative side who are budget conscious. Um, who you know, we, we can we can take that money that we're spending on prisons and turn it into a huge surplus if we can regulate and tax this product. You, you got to admit though, at least you're helping these people by sending them to prison because at least you're setting them into a drug-free environment where they. Can <laughs> <laughs> I always want you to think about that. We have the largest prison population on the planet Earth. 
We have one of the most efficient prison systems on the planet Earth. If you judge efficiency by we put you in, you only get out when we let you out. Okay, we don't, we don't hear about mass escapes from our prisons like you do in some countries. And in that huge efficient prison system, we have exactly zero drug-free prisons. Not one. And when I mention that at a Rotary Club, I always tell the Rotarians, when you leave the Rotary meeting today and you're driving by the local high school and you see that sign, you know that sign, drug-free school? Just remember that we don't have one drug-free prison in America and the difference between those people in the school and the people in the prison is the people in the school have all their liberties and the people in prison have none and we can't keep drugs out of prison and we're supposed to believe that that's a drug-free school? These are the kind of things you say to people. And when you want to know what you can do, the first thing you can do, how many people here, I'm going to ask it the reverse way. I hope I see very few hands go up. How many people here are not registered to vote? Outstanding! <laughs> That's the first thing you got to do is register to vote. And the second thing you got to remember is that bad things happen because good people stay silent. So vote and do not stay silent. In terms of messaging, MPP has always found that uh, making sure that people realize that marijuana is safer than alcohol is the biggest motivator for a change in uh, opinion. Uh, when people see that they can go out and like you know, have free access to a drug that causes you know tens of thousands of deaths a year, that causes massive amounts of addiction, and causes uh, you know a really serious uh, uh, monetary cost in terms of social harms versus a substance that causes almost none of those except because it's prohibited, uh, they really start to change their minds. I mean, it's, it's a really big motivator for change. And a lot of people don't really like uh, you know, doing the comparative harms issue, but it is something that really changes the way people vote. I, I could speak a little bit to messaging on campus, um, and it'll sort of be interesting to go off what you said. Uh, because in Ithaca, we worked on an equalization policy at PASS, um, and at first we were using the safer messaging, and we came to them with a proposal uh, and then we, part of our agreement in passing was actually not to say that. Uh, and it was to say, you know, not that we believe that marijuana is safe, but we're not trying to encourage students to use one or the other, and that we just wanted them to be able to make the choice for their own health and make their own decisions based on facts and not punishments. Um, so, so part of my advice would be, if your administrators are working with you, you know, agree on messaging with them so you don't piss them off and then shoot yourself in the foot. Absolutely. And same with legislators. Those equalization, uh, like, uh you know, I guess uh, you know, laws or rules on the college level are really important too because I mean this is where there's the biggest amount of uh, alcohol abuse and all of the uh, concordant problems that go along with that and you know, as long as you can actually make sure that people have the same uh, you know, level of punishment, uh, you know, not that there should be any, but uh, as long as it's at least equivalent, uh, you're going to get people moving in the right direction. Uh, Good Samaritan laws are another really big thing you got to push at the college level. Uh, people should not be afraid to call uh, like health professionals if somebody is OT. Something that's really powerful, look, anecdotally this seems to be the case in Pennsylvania, but when legislators hear from young people especially that in Pennsylvania we've got weird, fairly tough, uh, bizarre alcohol laws, right? Um, and because of them in Pennsylvania, it seems to be, again, no studies, but anecdotally, much easier for high school age students to get drugs than it is for them to get alcohol. So when legislators find that out, that high school kids have a hard time getting booze, but they have an easy time getting pot or pills, that changes the way they think about it, because then they start thinking about their kids or their grandkids. Um, really, you know, with a lot of people, that's what it has to come down to. When something affects them personally, you know, we see this on same-sex marriage policy, uh, things like that all the time. When something starts to affect somebody personally, all of a sudden it's a huge one, it's a massive revelation because all of a sudden it comes home. So I think that's a good way to message about it too. And that also touches on the regulation side of things. And that's a message point that when I lobby a lot, I'll, I'll start to point out the regulation. And they really love that. And I'll say that, you know, we're bringing marijuana use under the rule of law. Um, and that's a term that I very really like. Yeah, who do you want running it? Legitimate businesses or criminal gangs? Right. All right, we're going to get to questions uh, in one moment, but just one final question. Um, are there any tools or resources um, that you want to highlight that um, would be especially helpful for young marijuana policy reform advocates? 
go on MPP's site, there are uh, action links where you can uh, send pre-written letters to your legislators, and uh, you can also tailor them to uh, your own message. Um, if you just go on the website and there's a little map on the side, you can pick out your state and it'll connect you directly with uh, your county or uh, you know locality legislator. Don't be afraid to go meet with your legislators also. You know, call their offices, ask who some staffer is going to pick up the phone, ask for a meeting. You know, you might not get it with them, but you might get it with a member of their staff. That's really just as valuable. Everything gets passed along. And look, I've been with my boss for 12 years. It is so rare, so rare, that educated young people come into our office to advocate for any issue. Um, it, 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 it makes a big impact, believe it or not. I think there's this theory that, you know, we all just get paychecks and don't really care about what people think. Um, that's really not the case. You know, people run for office and people work for legislators because they're passionate about policy and government. Uh, and, and when people show that same sort of passion, there's a real connection that happens there. Don't ever discount that. Yeah, that's what I would say too. Your fellow to schedule meetings. Mm -hmm. um, any questions from the audience? What happens to people who are presently in prison over drug offenses when a state decriminalizes or legalizes? Are they freed because it's no longer illegal, or are they still held because it was illegal back when they committed the offense? I can just talk about our bill. Um, under our bill, which legalizes marijuana, people who are currently incarcerated are still incarcerated. And we don't want to promote this idea that um, uh, just because we're legalizing something, it doesn't, you know, you still made the decision to break the law. Um, sort of the good news is, is that most people who are in for marijuana offenses aren't in for very long. Um, you know, it's not ideal, but I, but I don't think we'd be able to, look, I think it's gonna, we're gonna have a hard time getting our bill passed anyway. I think it would be uh, much harder to get it passed if you just had an emancipation clause in it. Yeah, uh, clemency uh, clauses in any bill are pretty much a killer. Uh, it'll destroy any bill and make it almost impossible to pass because regardless of what people feel the law should be, uh, there are still a lot of people, that even uh, supporters of marijuana policy reform, that do respect the rule of law. And if you have broken the law and you got caught, then you should be punished. Um, that being said, Colorado is actually currently considering releasing a lot of people that were uh, either tried or imprisoned uh, just prior to the passage of MM64. Uh, that's still going through the courts right now, so we'll see how it plays out. You saw the same thing with the alcohol prohibition. Uh, uh, by the way, for everybody that likes that word decriminalization, alcohol prohibition was decriminalization. The only thing that they were arresting people for was manufacture or selling. They didn't arrest users. So basically it was decrim. But what happened was we legalized alcohol. See, if, if your big issue is getting the people out of prison, <laughs> then I'm an incrementalist. <laughs> okay, because what happened was we ended alcohol prohibition and then you saw the states over the next few years start to review these cases and start to release people and stuff like that. But. I, so I, I, I don't deny my own foibles. I'm an incrementalist when it comes to that. You know. in, in New Jersey, we are, or New York, we don't have a clemency clause because it would kill it. Right. But we are going to ask for an expungement clause in the New Jersey bill we decided. Um, so if that works, I'm going to suggest it for New York. Um, so that's something we're sort of playing with as an expungement rather than full clemency. Um, just real quick, is there any precedent with that? Um, with getting expungement clauses? Um, pass through, or would it be a relatively new field? Not that I know of. I mean, I, I basically had a conversation with ACLU about it, and that's the extent, you know, we decided we'll ask for it. We're going from there. Yeah. So, as a Madison resident, um, I'm looking forward to hopefully voting yes for uh, personal use of marijuana. What do you think are the biggest problems with the system in Colorado that maybe states in the Northeast could modify to make ours a little more? Appropriate or professional, as As far as I've seen, there are no problems. It seems to be working like gangbusters. <laughs> the, there was the problem with the Department of Health's uh, licensing. But. Yeah, it's, a, it's very restrictive licensing, and a lot of people that are trying to get into the industry have, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, viewed it as protectionism. Um, and, you know, the counter argument to that is that the only people that are allowed to partake in this new legal industry are people that already have experience in it. In, on the medical side. And I think that's a really important thing because not only do you have the experience to be able to run these businesses, 
But uh, as a voter, when you can see what a well-regulated medical marijuana system looks like, it makes it a lot easier to imagine what an adult use system looks like. Um, I think you know one of the biggest problems with passing uh, legalization bills is that people don't remember what it was like when marijuana was legal, and they uh, they can't imagine it. But in places that have very robust industries and that are well regulated, such as Colorado, uh, Maine, uh, New Mexico, uh, you know, Rhode Island, uh, people can imagine what that is going to look like, and it makes it a lot easier for them to check yes at the voter box. Bring it back. Um, I was just wondering. Uh, how can students um, get people who have been affected by the drug more than most, specifically the lower class, to um, to like have the coalition pretty much together and get them in the movement? I guess I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Basically, with a lot of Well, that's a really important issue. Uh, it's actually the most important issue because, I mean, we've seen, um, particularly with marijuana, that uh, regardless of any sort of uh, intentions, uh, the end result is an extremely racist enforcement uh, spectrum. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people in, uh, like, that are in positions to be able to uh, uh, educate people in their communities are uh, sort of stuck in a drug war mentality. They uh, view the problems that are associated with drugs such as mass incarceration and uh, you know uh, police brutality, uh, you know uh, uh, basic uh, oppression by uh, law enforcement and by the state uh, as problems that are associated with drugs and not with prohibition. Uh, so really, it just takes uh, you know public education. And uh, the ACLU recently came out with a report that very detailed uh, like uh, breakdown of the racial disparities and arrests in every single state and how much uh, the state wastes on marijuana enforcement. Uh, get that report into the hands of anybody that has any power. <laughs> uh, Tyler? Um, so as far as states that don't have, um, so we're talking about like legalization of cannabis, states that don't have a bill, haven't had a bill, um, in your experience, what is like the first step, like at what point would you say that you said like, yes, we're running a legalization bill this session or this year or like an amendment this year, you know, where does it start? Like what's that first step? And I guess more specifically specifically for us, how can we be a part of that first step and like just get that step there? In New Jersey and New York, we sort of decided to introduce a bill when both when legislators actually in both states, uh, legislators have wanted to and we sort of asked them to wait a bit um, because we felt it wasn't ready, but then we sort of okayed it um, or gave our blessing when we thought um, the conversation was ready to be started. You know, medical marijuana was just that over. We gave up the New Jersey program. Uh, in New York, we tried three sessions to pass medical marijuana, and once we gave up, we just said, all right, let's start the legalization conversation. Um, so I think it depends. You know, three or four years down the road where you think it could actually pass is when I'd say start the conversation. Um, and the first step would be meeting with the legislator. Um, and you don't eventually need both houses, but you can start with one uh, and tell them you have this idea and see what they think. I mean, really, you just got to throw on a suit and go beat the halls until you find something yeah. that's willing to sponsor a bill and yeah. come up with decent language. Uh, I'm, um, so I'm from URI, and um, a lot of times when we're tabling on campus, like we have a banner and stuff that says, like, help us legalize marijuana and stuff, but, <clears throat> but people will come up and be like, oh, yeah, I'll vote for that, and, like, then we have to, like, explain, you know, it's not a ballot initiative. So I feel like we always hit this roadblock when, as soon as we say, call your legislator or something like that because you know we're the ones who like obviously we're like come to our meetings because we're the ones who are going to testify and stuff but it's really hard to get just the average person on a college campus to feel empowered like they can actually affect it when they can't vote on it so how can and it's just hard for us to get them to like even call so is there any other advice that you can give us as to how we can empower just average people who don't want to call that's not a problem just among them college yeah. students, that's, that's a problem nationwide. We're, we're just staggeringly apathetic in this country. Um, my boss happens to be running for Congress. Um, he's got a huge primary on May 20th 
<clears throat> and so most weekends, if I wasn't here, well, maybe not because it's raining, but most weekends I'd be out pounding doors for him, and nobody knows this is happening. Nobody knows that we've got a huge Democratic primary uh, for, for, for our governor's race in just two months. People just aren't paying attention. Um, you know, sometimes I think what's more effective is, um, I think sometimes it's, it's better to find one person who's willing to make 10 phone calls than 10 people who are willing to make one phone call. It's easier, um, you know, that's, those are the people you can build a coalition around. Those are the people who are going to find another person who's willing to make 10 phone calls. Um, that's my, so that's my advice. It's hard, I mean, if, if I had, if I had the, the solution to that problem, I'd have a much better job than I do. <laughs> also, SSDP does awesome phone banking projects, so uh, if you can even get like five people in a room together making phone calls, uh, you know, maybe they'll bring their friends next time. I'm gonna wait back. Um. This is mostly for you, Mr. Chris. Uh, we're talking about legalization of marijuana and talking about how it's kind of inevitable. After the legalization of marijuana, will the prohibition of other substances end with more ease, or are we going to be looking at similar drug war?